Feeling the Light Chapter 7 Ninety-nine percent of the field is trying to control upper limbs. These guys are obsessed because that's the only thing they know how to do. Miguel Nicolilis said while seated in his office at Duke University's Leafy Medical School campus, That's the same thing we did in 2000. It happens a lot in science. There is one idea and everyone tries to follow that idea. Our lab creates these ideas, many all at once. Our idea is to go way beyond that. It was the summer of 2012 and outside Nicolilis' window, construction crews were noisily creating a new glass and steel structure amid the, hilly, amid the hilly campus's evergreens and oaks. Inside his office, however, the neuroscientist was thinking about soccer. That year's Brazilian team was being compared to the storied team of 1970, which under the likes of Carlos Alberto and Pele was perfect during its World Cup victory. The team was playing in the Euro Cup, and Nicolilis was planning to stay up late to see the game, which he'd been previewing on his iPad. Nicolilis first developed his passion for soccer as a child in Brazil, where he studied medicine before immigrating to the States to work with the psychologist John Chapin. In the summer of 2012, however, Nicol Eglis was thinking about soccer in an entirely different way. Namely, he was working with an international team of scientists to build a full-body, brain-controlled exoskeleton. The plan, and Nicol Eglis, as Nicol Eglis envisioned it, would be for a quadriplegic, quadriplegic to don the exoskeleton during the opening ceremonies of the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. Rising from a wheelchair, he or she would use the exoskeleton to walk to center field and kick a soccer ball before the first match. The opening kick would be a demonstration that science can almost do the impossible, make someone walk again, he said. It would be the only soccer game in Brazilian history where nobody re remembers the result of the game because they would be more fascinating by what happens as at the opening. To that end, Nicolilis had devoted several bays in his vast monkey lab to what he calls the Walk Again Project, which he believed would move the field beyond upper limb prosthetics to enable full body control. Nicolilis and his collaborators were working to expand the recording capacity of their electrodes, moving beyond the Utah array, and instead implanting research animals with hundreds of electrodes across multiple brain regions. We need 141 degrees of freedom for that exoskeleton to be fully operational. Legs, arms, fingers, everything. You don't do that with 200 neurons, he said. Once you start getting 10,000 or 20,000 neurons recorded simultaneously, this is going to change the game because you're not talking about seven degrees of freedom. You're talking about tens of degrees of freedom. A short walk across campus, Nicolilis' monkey lab is a testament to the scientists' success. The one-story building is clad in iconic Duke stone, a rough-hewn slate-like material flecked with blues, tans, and rust quarried in nearby Hillsboro, North Carolina. Whereas most labs rely on other departments to perform implantation surgeries, Nicolilis's lab boasted a dedicated operating room for the procedure. Located near the lab's entrance, the room was built for monkey-sized patients with a small stainless steel operating table at its center. A large microscope stood to the right of the table in various contraptions and EKG machine heating pads and oscilloscope sat on a counter running the length of the room. From the ceiling hung a pair of surgical lamps, while shelves housed an assortment of Huggies diapers and catheter tips. Nicolilis's lab is U-shaped with an individual observation rooms just outside the interior monkey base. Sock puppets, black lights, Clorox wipes, and assortment of what looked like retired cables, electrode strips, and wires littered the workplace. Where under Nicolilis's guidance, researchers have performed some of the most radical BCI experiments on the planet. In one bay, a monkey named Cherry was running a basic centered out task, moving a virtual computer arm from a home position 
to a randomly selected target in another area of the screen. The twist here was that Cherry was not controlling just one arm. She was using nearly 800 electrodes implanted in 10 separate areas to control two arms simultaneously. Each arm had only two degrees of freedom, or a total of four degrees. So far, her accuracy rate was around 80%. As Cherry worked, a graduate student named Peter Ift manned the three computers studying her progress from the observation room. Two of the computers were devoted to recording Cherry's brain activity. The third funneled those recordings through an algorithmic maze, calculating as many as 10,000 neural spikes per second, and translated them into virtual arm movements. The room's five monitors showed grid after grid of individual electrode recordings, which formed undulating waves of blue, yellow, and pink representing individual neurons each electrode shaft recorded. An audio monitor crackled with the sound of Cherry's humming brain, while above Ift's workspace, a black and white monitor showed the animal sitting in a metal chair. The grainy image showed Cher Sherry with the what looked like a plastic halo crowding her head. It was actually an enclosed cup that housed her implants electronics. The implants extended her nervous system via a thick bundle of rainbow-colored ribbon wires that flowed from her cranium up to the ceiling and into the observation room, where they cascaded into Ift's computers. We're scaling up the system. It all has to do with the same more complete BMI, a full-body BMI, said if A tall man dressed in a white full-body lab suit. We're aiming for a two-limb BMI, which is another level of complexity. More cells, more channels, more quality recordings should enable that. Cherry's microelectrodes were spread across various regions of her brain. Not only the primary motor, premotor, and sensory cortices, but also a higher order brain regions associated with cognition and decision making. The idea was that by listening to those regions communicate with another, the Nicolilis lab could recreate more refined and complex motor movements across both arms, which they would eventually integrate into a full body BCI. Scaling up to two arms wasn't so straightforward as simply implanting electrodes in both motor, motor cortices. Rather, the Duke team had found cells in other brain regions that were inactive when Sherry used only one arm but sparked to life when they used both. The trick was recreating a BCI that understood which movement Sherry was to make. Simply grasp a jar or grasp a jar and open its lid and coordinate the movements. It became even more complicated at the cellular level, whereas neurons in the motor cortex were directionally tuned for one-arm movements. The cell's tuning properties shifted when the movement was integrated with a second arm. A truly functional bilateral BCI would have to understand this higher-order state, determining whether the user was trying to move one or both arms. 800 neurons delivered ample information for Sherry to control two arms but Nicolilis was convinced they'd need many more for a full-body exoskeleton. It's going across the threshold for control that can be useful for patients, he said. That's the key issue here. If you have only 20 to 50 neurons available in your recording, forget it. You're not going to do anything meaningful. A big part of that issue is going beyond mere voluntary movement of the arms and legs. An exoskeleton would have to mind the brain for subtler controls like gait and balance aspect that are thought to be subcortical buried beneath the neocortex and some of the brain's older structures. But here, Nicoli List was convinced he'd already found a solution. The same pools of neurons that control the legs can produce information about the posture of the animal, he said. We have posture control in monkeys from the motor cortex, which is a big breakthrough. Enabling this sort of subtler neural control was the order of one day the monkey would bay down. 
where researchers were testing a miniature prototype of the exoskeleton. The prototype comprised only a padded pelvic girdle and a pair of leg braces outfitted with pneumonic pistons. Researchers had suspended the monkey-sized exoskeleton from an aluminum frame, which had a collar extending from its top beam to secure the animal in place. The entire apparatus was built around a treadmill, which researchers were using to stimulate bipedal motion. Maquez don't naturally walk a Maquez don't naturally walk long distances on their hind legs, but after a bit of wrangling, the researchers managed to strap the large monkey named Mango into the exoskeleton. Using Velcro straps to secure his legs, they restrained Mango's upper body with a, the throat collar. The monkey was still being trained to walk upright, and he looked a little confused in his new rig. His tongue stuck out slightly between his teeth and his torso and legs, naturally given to a quadruple couch where stretched vertically, his feet slightly pigeon-toed. They just barely touched the treadmill. As researchers began applying pieces of reflected tape at his hips, knees, and ankles, black lights were placed in a ring around the frame, then using a modified Microsoft Connect, the researchers planned to track the monkey's gait. Once Mango was situated, the researchers closed the door to the monkey bay while a graduate student turned on pneumatic pump. The motor sputtered to life with a staccato hiss at it fed tiny bursts of air into the exoskeleton's pistons, compelling Mango's legs to walk along the treadmill. Batched in the black light, the monkey's hairy legs appeared otherworldly on this observation room's monitor. The screen showed a box of superimposed at each joint, presenting a constantly shifting numerical value as the animal's leg flexed and extended. The information was being sent to the computer via the connect, which measured the depth of each joint angle as the pump swung Mango's left leg out in front of him and moved it back into position. Like Cherry, Mango wore a plastic crown, but unlike Cherry's system, which was tethered by wires, Mango's unit wirelessly transmitted his neural activity to the bank of computers in the next room. It wasn't a particularly elegant setup. The sealable plastic crown was attached to Mango's skull. With the same dental cement researchers used to protect the craniotomy area. Bulky through, though it might have been, however, the plastic crown gave researchers a sterile area to house Mango's telemetry unit. Powered by onboard batteries, the system enabled Mango to move about the research environment without the threat of tangling or damaging the wires. We're basically connect, collecting the first true animals that are controlling a BMI wirelessly, Nicolilis said. The monkey will basically be free of any tethering or restraint or anything. For the moment, however, the wireless system was merely recording Mango's brain activity. The researchers were still trying to habituate him to the leg braces. And they were just beginning to acquaint him with the task of walking on cue, their plan eventually was to paralyze the monkey's legs temporarily, prompting him to use the wireless BCI to control the exoskeleton. But for now, the exoskeleton was under full con computer control. The treadmill remained stationary as the monkey's brain signals jumped skyward, his legs moving backward and forward. This early prototype was a long way off from a functional brain-controlled exoskeleton, but it was a start. I'm not treating this as life or death, Nicolilis said. I joke with the Brazilian president that this is the Brazilian moonshot. It's precisely the sort of bravaria that has made Nicolilis so controversial in the field, but his showmanship coupled with cutting-edge BCI work has also made him one of the most recognizable figures. It's a role he clearly relishes, and Nicolilis has been the driving force behind many of the fields first, from his 1999 paper that coined the phrase brain-machine interface, to his later monkey experiments. Through it all, however, Nicolilis insists he is more interested in using BCI to shed light on how the brain functions and to question traditional notions of the biological self. When we created brain-machine interfaces, it was not to create prosthetic devices. 
The goal was to have a new tool to probe the brain, he said. We're using the prosthetic work to develop a completely new theory of how the brain works. Nobody's doing that. For much of the 20th century, perhaps no two neuroscientists were more influential than David Hubel and Torsten Weisel, Weisel, whose groundbreaking research into visual processing of cats, among other things, won them the Nobel Prize in 1981. Working with both anesthetized and awake animals, the researchers measured the response of individual neurons as they presented the cats with different visual shapes and patterns. During the first months of experimentation, the scientists failed to elicit neural responses from the visual stimuli. Then one day, the hard edge of the slide plate they used to project their patterns slipped across the screen. It was a mistake, but as so often happens in science, the mistake proved decisive. Unlike earlier stimuli, the diagonal line of the slide edge caused the neuron to spark to life. The researchers realized that the cell responded to visual stimuli of a line falling across the retina. But there was a wrinkle. The line had to be in a particular position and oriented for the cell to rapid fire. Change the orientation and the neuron's response diminished. They found that other cells responded more strongly when the line was at different angles, while still others responded to motion, light, or shadow. Hubble and Weissel's research served as a foundation for what became the dominant theory of visual perception. Namely, the brain builds complex optical scenes by first perceiving simple features like lines and shadows. The brain channels that basic visual information to higher brain regions, which form increasingly complex patterns, eventually completing the visual stimulus. Their studies indicated a clear cause and effect relationship between external stimuli and evoked neural responses. More recently, however, neuroscientists have argued that this model gives an incomplete accounting of the conscious brain, arguing that the stimulus response model doesn't take into account the conscious brain's internal state, not only its expectation of a stimulus, but also its evolutionary history. While some individual cells are undoubtedly in a direct cause and effect relationship with incoming stimuli, those cells hardly tell the whole story, and studying them in isolation has pitfalls of its own. The widespread use of microelectrodes focus the experimental research on the behavior of single neurons and the possibility that their individual properties could account for much of what the brain does. Both the neurophysiologist and historian James T. McIlwain. As you sit in a darkened laboratory with your attention riveted to the sounds of the audio monitor and probe a neuron's respective field with a vi tiny visual stimulus, it's easy to forget that the cell you are listening to is but one of many that are responding to the stimulus. Nevertheless, many neuroscientists in the 20th century were confined to studying individual neurons and in anesthetized animals. They simply lacked the ability to record from ensembles of neurons, let alone ensembles across various brain regions in awake animals. As a young medical student, Nicolulis hatched the idea that by implanting multiple electrodes along different regions of a given brain circuit, he could create a physiological map to visualize how information moves along a neural pathway. By recording from different locations along the circuit, he theorized he would be able to add a fourth dimension, time, to his map, charting the shifting neural signals as they move from lower to higher brain regions. When he approached his Brazilian mentor with this scheme, the elder neuroscientist was adamant. It is time for you to finish your thesis, leave the laboratory, and go abroad. Nicolaitis recounts in Beyond Boundaries, his autobiographical account of his research. What you want to do, neither I nor anyone else in Brazil can help you achieve. Within a year, Nicolaitis had been invited to join John Chapin's lab at Hanneman University in Philadelphia. Like Nicolaitis Chapin was looking to expand his recording abilities, he wanted to move beyond the practice of recording from single neurons, hoping instead to use a novel technique 
to record from single several neural populations at once instead of implanting a single rigid wire in the brain. Chapin wanted to use new arrays with many as 16 flexible microwires. The new arrays not only would enable them to record from multiple neurons, but also would permanently be implanted. The prevailing theory of sensory perception held that tactile sensations were conveyed through the mechano receptors in the skin by electrical impulses that move from the peripheral to the central nervous system. Maps of the sensory cortex showed that particular areas of cortex responded to specific areas of the body, known as the homonucleus. These maps roughly parallel an animal's physical body with certain areas of cortex becoming active when an animal receives stimulations at a corresponding body part. This cortical mapping is perhaps most explicit in the snout region of rodents. Recording from single neurons earlier, researchers had found that areas in organized into a well-delineated grid with clusters of neurons or barrels mirroring the grid-like pattern of individual whiskers on the animal's snout. Researcher after researcher had demonstrated that neurons in these barrels Corresponded to particular whiskers, when the whisker received stimulation, neurons in the related barrel would fire like mad. The correspondence wasn't limited to rodents' primary sensory cortex. Similar maps existed in the lower subcortical relay points that form neural chains between physical whiskers and the sensory cortex. Accordingly, these subcortical neurons would release a series of action potentials when researchers stimulated the appropriate whiskers. Still, most researchers confine themselves to studying individual neurons, solidly solidifying the notion that those neurons were in a direct and exclusive relationship with specific whiskers. Then, the theory held sway for years, becoming only somewhat more complicated in the 1980s, when researchers found neurons could also respond to neighboring whiskers. By the early 1990s, however, Chapin and Nicolilis had set out to simultaneously record multiple individual neurons that projected to different barrels in the sensory cortex. At first, the researchers used the sharpened shafts of the Q-tips to mechanically stimulate individual whiskers of lightly anesthetized rats, and surprisingly, they had found that neurons were closely associated with Specific whiskers released quick bursts of action potentials when they touched the corresponding whisker. Similarly, they confirmed that neurons would also respond, albeit less robustly, when they stimulated nearby whiskers. Where their study different from early work, however, was that they looked at multiple neurons over time. The researchers found that instead of simply having a direct casual relationship with the primary whisker, the neuron's receptive field migrated in the milliseconds following the onset of stimulation. The relationship between a neuron and its primary whisker was not set. Rather, it was dynamic through time and space. A neuron became responsive to different areas of the snout at different times during stimulation. These subcortical maps shifted. They reorganized. To further test the theory, the researchers began anesthetizing small patches of skin on the rodent snouts, prohibiting those the primary whiskers from sending sensory information to their associated neurons. If their theory was correct, the neurons would reorganize, shifting their receptive fields to that area where receiving stimulation. Sure enough, within a few seconds of numbing a patch of skin, the rat's whiskers mapped reorganized to reflect the altered sensory reality. Armed with this information, Nicolilis and Chapin moved to awake animals. By monitoring multiple groups of neurons, they found that individual neurons throughout the sensory system responded to multiple whiskers. The cells weren't confined to individual whiskers and deaf to others. Rather, they shifted in sensitivity depending on the source of the stimulus. Importantly, later research in awake animals showed that they experienced neural activity in their sensory cortices before their whiskers touched anything at all. Researchers found that when an animal anticipated contact, sensory neurons responded as though the whiskers were already being stimulated. By decoding these anticipatory firing patterns, researchers could even predict whether the rats could correctly identify the source of stimulation before it was applied. 
It was a radical departure from the earlier cause and effect or feed forward model. Far from being a passive organ that merely reacted to external stimuli, the brain actively constructed experience, anticipating sensation and influencing the brain's reception of incoming sensory stimuli. Hubble Weisel cannot be right because they said that the pathway was only activated when the periphery is stimulated. Uh, uh, the pathway is being activated throughout, said Nicolilis. The anticipatory activity modulates the responses that are coming from the whiskers. Nicolilis and Chapin had the data to support their conclusions, but to hear Nicolilis tell it, the academic journals resisted publishing their research. Fellow neuroscientists were highly skeptical, even hostile. It was like going against Jesus Christ and his disciples were the most violent gang I ever met in my career. They would go around like the bishops of a church saying this is not part of not part of the canon. This is not the dogma, said Nicolilis, adding that his Brazilian genes helped a lot. None of this neuroscience from the 20th century survived. It's all gone. It's not easy because we're talking about Nobel laureates who were very important, very fundamental, but their work was context dependent. All the feed forward models of the brain are going to disappear because they can't handle any of this. Feed-forward neural networks cannot explain expectation. One problem Nicolilis and Chapman had while trying to sway their colleagues was that they were working in the sensory system. Sure, they could present their data, but rats couldn't give an unequivocal outward expression of their sensation. The data showed neural activity, but the animal's behavior, its experience? A rat couldn't tell you what it felt. It was a matter of interpretation. An interpretation their colleagues would easily dismiss. People would say, oh, you're deriving this mathematical formula from the recordings, but who guarantees the animal does anything with that information, said Nicolilis. Of course, it's possible to answer. Of course, it's impossible to answer. They needed a demonstration that was categorical. They needed a research paradigm to show the importance of neural populations and expectations. They needed something that could measure. They needed, in a word, to move the motor system. That's what, when we came up with the brain machine interface, he said, instead of just recording. Let's record and throw this to a device. Let's see if the device reproduces what the animal does with its own body. Recording from 46 neurons in a rat's motor cortex, Chapin and Nikolai Lish trained the animal to press a bar and receive a sip of water. As the researcher ran the animal's neural activity through a computer, the rodent eventually realized it didn't need to physically press the bar. It merely had to think about it to receive a reward. It was unbelievable. People who would shout at us, people would stand up and say, it cannot be. Then we started inviting people to come see the recordings. These big shots, their eyes would pop out, he said. It was checkmate. Nicolilis soon expanded on the original paper, moving into the more complex realm of the monkey cortex. This early work at, attracted the interest of DARPA's Alan Rudolph, who in 2002 provided Nicolilis with $26 million, enabling him to produce a series of headline wrapping demonstrations, linking his monkey's 
first to robot arms hundreds of miles away and later to a walking robot in Japan. DARPA awarded Nikolai Liss a performance award in 2002 as he went head-to-head with Donahue and Schwartz. But by the time the agency again bestowed the award on him in 2007, the landscape of DARPA had already shifted. In response to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, DARPA had ushered in the revolutionizing prosthetics program, replacing Rudolph with Jeffrey Ling, the hard-charging colonel who enlisted other labs to develop upper limb prosthetics. DARPA's shift in focus did not bode well for Nicolilis, who watched as his funding began to disappear. My reward for getting the performance award the second time was that they dumped us to build that arm, he said. It was almost an obsession. Sure, you can build an arm if you throw money at it, but the question is, can you work with that arm? Can you control that arm? And nothing I have seen in the past three to four years has proved that they can. Nicolilis says that by 2008, he had lost all of his DARPA funding. We were the best group in the country by several miles, he said. We were making all this progress. We started the whole business, but then when the new director came, we could never get our situation solved. We were being bled without knowing why. But other researchers didn't find Nicolilis' loss of funding so mysterious, though he was on the field's earliest and brightest stars. They claimed his work at times lacked rigor, and many groused that the Brazilians' grand proclamations and provocation research paradigms sometimes promised more than his data could support. Rudolph had been a great advocate of Nicolilis' work, but the singularity-focused link needed measurable results. He thinks there's a conspiracy against him, but it's like anyone else. You have to write decent grants and you have to deliver, said Schwartz. It's not a mystery. He's got to play by the same rules as all of us. With the money drying up, Nicolulis says his lab was in jeopardy of closing. He had greatly expanded his operations with earlier grants. Now he needed to find a way to keep it running. The NIH budget is going down. NSF is disappearing. The only budget surviving is the military, he said. It is a secret between scientists. It's called post-DARPA death. You go to DARPA and then you get tons of money like they gave to me, but very few people survive after DARPA funding because you can never replace it. As his fellow researchers began to work on upper limb prosthesis and DARPA slipstream, Nicolilis was already moving on. To his mind, his monkey work from the early years of the 21st century had demonstrated all there was to show that upper limb BCIs were possible. People are afraid of risking it. People play safe. The system encourages that, he said, just a little tiny details and boom, it's a nature paper. We think totally different. We want to describe the big macro picture, not just for upper limbs, but for everything, locomotion, new sensory signals, because I think that's where we're going to have the real big prize. To that end, Nicolilis's rat lab boasted row after row of amber-colored plastic cages, the containers each about the size of a shoebox, housed a few scores of black mice. Some were balled up and resting, others moved freely. But these were no regular mice. Each mouse sported an implant atop its skull. They were also transgenic, genetically engineered to exhibit certain disease rats, like Parkinson's, or OCD like symptoms. Like the monkey's lab, Nicolilis rodent lab was a large enterprise, several rooms filled with old monitors, beakers, valves, and powdered chemicals. To the left was a small operating room where researchers used microscopes to install electrodes in mice and rats. To the right were several large rooms brimming with electrode leads hanging from the wall and silver ventilation tubes on the ceiling. In the middle of one of the lab's central rooms, researchers had set up a behavior chamber where the researcher Eric Thompson was working with a rat named Teal. Thomas is a tall man. He parts his brown hair to the side and wears black wire-rimmed glasses. He would move excitedly through the lab, grabbing his paper for that study, hunting down a specific electrode and marveling at the smallness of some of his implants. 
His setup wasn't as elaborate as the monkey's lab, but that was okay. He is on his own words, more of a rat guy anyway. The focus of his attention these days, though, was a behavior chamber, a large square aquarium that they draped in the black cloth. Researchers had placed a black cylinder inside the cube. The cylinder was a sort of rodent arena. At its base were three nodes that formed a triangle. These nodes looked something like spotlights, but instead of telling the animal to stop or go, the nodes' red light emitted an infrared light, the yellow light released a water reward, and the green light emitted a traditional light. To the left of this contraption was a blue car corral that housed a small monitor showing teal in the darkened chamber. Nearby, what a computer was connected to a lab-made neural stimulator. The green circuit board was about the size of a VHS tape, posted a multitude of transistors and wires, which sent small electrical pulses to Teal's sensory cortex. The task here was to endow Teal with an infrared vision. The rat had an infrared sensor attached to its head, and the idea was that the sensor would register each time one of the chamber's infrared lights became active. The sensor would speak to the computer, which would send brief impulses to, of electricity to the animal's sensory cortex. The stimulation frequency increased as Teal's approached the light source, enabling the animal to gouge how far it was from the light, or in rat terms, from its water reward. Researchers had used both traditional and infrared light to train the rodent. When the lights shone, they stimulated Teal's brain, increasing the frequency as the animal approached the lights. One Teal made the connection between increasing stimulation frequency and their reward. They turned off the normal light, left the only infrared-based stimulation. The rat soon learned to associate increased stimulation alone with a water reward. The animal couldn't see the infrared light source, but outfitted with an implant and infrared sensor, it could nevertheless locate the active node endowing Teal with the Nicoli, what Nicoli List called a sixth sense. It doesn't see the light. It feels a tactile stimulus. But what emerges from that, he asked? We don't know. One result that Nicoli List found particularly interesting was that Teal's behavior changed over time. Whereas, whereas the rat had initially pawed at her snout when researchers stimulated her sensory cortex, she eventually gave up that behavior. Instead, she began moving her head back and forth, scanning the chamber as she sought out the infrared light. Not only did the animal perceive the infrared, but that influenced the whole behavior of the animal. An animal that used to walk straight like any rat does now walks with this sweeping motion, she, he said. It sounds like a simple thing, but it's an altered the animal's entire behavior to find the water. Sure enough, as Teal appeared on the lab's small black and white monitor, she turned left and right, hoping to perceive an infrared signal. The camera they'd mounted atop the cylinder made the chamber's face look like a mottled moonscape as Teal, her head tethered to a mesh cable, received information from her extended nervous system, silently processing this novel sense of vision. As she swept the area, one of the nodes lit up. The animal's oscillatory movements quickly diminished as she homed in on the light source, racing in a straight line to her water reward. In a characteristic flourish, Nicolilis had opted to stimulate the rat's sensory cortex as opposed to the visual cortex. In the classic conception of the brain, specific areas like the sensory and visual cortices were thought to be linked to specific functions like touch or vision. Scientists believe neurons were devoted solely to those functions and incapable of taking on new modulation modalities. It wasn't until researchers discovered the principles of neuroplasticity that they began to theorize that areas of cortex normally associated with one function might be recruited to others. What we're funding with the BCI and other work is that there, there's more of a continuum. These borders that we define don't make much, make much sense for the brain, Nicoli List said. We can induce a piece of cortex that is theoretically related to touch to process information about a completely different modality, like infrared. Neurons formerly associated with one sensory input could be harnessed to process other senses, enabling Teal to perceive a portion of the light spectrum that very few animals have evolved to see on their own. 
We are transforming infrared perception, he said. It's almost like the guy is touching it, but it's not touching the body anymore. It's out there in the world. Still, Teal wasn't able to say what she had perceived, and it wasn't entirely clear that the rat was experiencing something we'd recognized as vision. Certainly, the animal responded to stimulation of its sensory cortex, but the study left open the question of whether Teal was responding to a visual depiction of infrared light or if she was merely responding to increased stimulation. The stimulus was linked to infrared light, but that could be incidental. The rat's experience might have been purely physical. But Nicolilis insists something else is at play. What we found is that the neurons basically start responding to touch and infrared. The infrared does not hijack the cortex, he said. We are making them feel light. Perhaps even more radical was the vein of research Nicola Liss's collaborators were pursuing to create a BCI that linked the brains of two animals. Working once again with implanted rats, the researchers placed the animals in separate behavior cham chambers. A wall in each chamber was outfitted with a pair of levers, one lever to the right, another one to the left. Above each lever was a light. The chamber's opposite wall housed a funnel where the animals received their juice reward. The task was fairly simple. Researchers trained the first rat, known as the encoder, to press a lever each time it, its corresponding light came on. The animal received a juice reward whenever it chose correctly. With a simple task like this, a classic really, the encoder rat had a near perfect success near perfect success rate. Meanwhile, researchers used electrodes to record the animal's brain activity, mining it for specific features linked to deciding which bar to press and the action of pressing the bar. Where the experiment differed, however, was that what happened next. Taking the encoding animal's recordings, they transferred the neural pattern to a separate computer, which in turn uploaded the stimulation pattern to a second rat, known as the decoder. The second animal did not have the same visual cues as the first rat. Both lights in its behavior chamber remained on. The decoder rat had to rely exclusively on neural stimulation to decide which bar was the correct one to press to receive its reward. Previous researchers had shown they could control animal behavior through microstimulation, prompting rats to move right, left, and forward by sending specific signals to the brain. Nicolilis' decoding rat, by contrast, was not only receiving biologically generated stimulation patterns, but actually making sense of those patterns, using them to guide its own behavior. The rat has no idea what it's supposed to do, said Nicolilis, but he's able to decode the brain activity that comes from the first rat and produce the behavior. In other words, the decode rat was having a similar neural experience as the encoding rat. To make things more interesting, Nicolilis then closed the loop, linking the first rat's reward to the second rat's performance. In the experimental paradigm, the first rat received a juice reward because only if the second rat successfully completed the task. Because the first animal had already successfully completed the task, it's expected its reward. What the researchers found, however, was if the reward was a forthcoming, the rat would concentrate more intensively during the next trial, enhancing its brain signal and making it more readable to the second animal. They are actually working together, Nicolilis said. They made one brain out of two brains. It's a super brain, an organic computer. A set of related experiments, Nicolilis and his colleagues stimulated the whiskers of the first rat by having it explore various sized apertures. If the aperture was small, the animal received a reward if it moved to the left. If the aperture was large, the animal was rewarded, then it moved to the right. After uploading the first animal's neural activity to the second rat, they again closed the loop, linking the first animal's reward to the second animal's performance. Researchers found that the second animal could correctly read the incoming signal 65% of the time. For Nicolilis, it's the sort of brain-to-brain -brain interface that not only sets him apart from other researchers, but also suggests the true potential of neuroprosthetics. It's not about moving an arm. It's about suggesting that to the brain that is so plastic that it can incorporate another body as its source of information to probe the world, he said. That touches the theories of self, theories of identity. 
once you connect brains like that, who is to say there's not another level of emergent properties that materialize by the interaction of the two brains? It's just this sort of speculation that makes many of Nicolilis's rivals bristle. We are all interested in these very provocative questions, said Brown University's John Donahue when asked about Nicolilis's work. We are all deadly serious scientists who are interested in how the brain works. Nicolilis, he said, by the way of contrast, seems less interested in basic science. Is this for showmanship? Why is it done? I don't know. The roots of all things have already been done. If it's a vehicle for provoking conversation, it's sort of not how we usually do that in science, he said. It's another niche. It seems to get more and more marginalized and less and less interesting, except for the press. But Nicolilis is undeterred by his own rival's criticism. He insists that he is more interested in unlocking the mysteries of the brain and consciousness than in merely making incremental progress on an already established proof of principle. What I'm trying to see is if you put several brains to work like this, you may have a result we cannot even predict. We may be able to compute things that a single brain could not compute, he said. None of the BCI literature on upper limb outside this lab touches on that. It's not that they're not doing it. It's worse than that. Nobody's even thinking about it.